You are listening to Has the Chipotle, the show that will take you to discover the edible treasures of Mexico. Episode 24. Welcome to this episode of Paz de Chipotle, the audible companion of Sabor, This is Mexican Food, a digital magazine dedicated to exploring the markets, streets, recipes and traditions that make Mexico an edible paradise. I'm your host, Rocío Carvajal, food history writer, cook and author. To find more information about this show, please go to pasdechipotle.com. Find the show on Twitter as Chipotle Podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Paz de Chipotle. I want to thank you all for the shouts and kind messages about the previous episode about supper clubs, how to make money following your passion. And let me give you an update about that. As you have heard and seen on my social media, I wrote a Kindle ebook about supper clubs, which is available for free for Kindle Unlimited subscribers. However, if you are not a Kindle Unlimited subscriber, you can download it straight from Amazon's platform for 99 US dollar cents, or its equivalent in the rest of the world. In the future, I will set up another giveaway, so make sure you subscribe to my newsletter and follow me on Instagram and Twitter so you don't miss it. I want to say a quick word about the unexpected and tragic loss of Anthony Bourdain, a chef turned wordsmith who used his gravitas to cast light on the double standards of the food industry in the US and actively supported the recognition of the talent and hard work of thousands of Mexican workers feeding America. He was a complex and deeply sensitive person who, until the end, He gave us handfuls of his poignant and pertinent opinions. Thank you, Anthony. I, for one, think that the best tribute is to never stop asking questions, especially the difficult ones, challenge our own views, and continue touching lives with our work. This week's episode is the first part of a story about the Mexican markets. And today, I'll be exploring the history of the pre-Columbian markets. And on the second part, I'll take you to explore the many different types of contemporary markets of Mexico that are part of a long-standing tradition of trade, community life, and a celebration of our mixed heritage. I hope you enjoy this episode. Pretty much every food travel program about Mexico dedicates a generous section to talk about our famously busy wholesale and food markets. You have probably seen them many times even. The all too familiar scenes where everywhere you look is saturated with astonishingly vibrant colors, piles of succulent fruits, no-nonsense butcher's stalls with pigs' heads hanging and rows of chicken with their feet upwards resting on a bed of parsley leaves. And of course you have seen those mesmerizing scenes of the wonderful food sections with their lovely earthenware pots with bubbly stews, moles and soups, and a corn bonanza and all its derived products, tortillas, tacos, tamales, tlacoyos, all of it tempting hungry passers-by to indulge in a treat. I grew up in Mexico and believe me, Still to this day, I always feel amazed and excited when visiting markets, because once you look behind the charm of the exotic, markets in Mexico are indeed the powerhouse of each town and each city, and they are at the center of communal life and the cultural identity of our society. 
So today, I'm going to take you to explore the fascinating history that set the basis of the Grand Mexican markets that, to this day, we know and enjoy. In many hyper-industrialized economies, people can choose now to only source their food from the supermarkets if they wish to do so. Rows of aisles with neatly packed vegetables, identical cuts of meat, perfectly packed fruit from the other side of the world, a true luxury of choice within our reach. And without really noticing, every trip to the supermarket compresses thousands of years of agricultural innovation, exploration, and even trade and politics. Markets of all kinds are present in different ways in almost every civilization, and they have played similar social roles. While in large urban centers, markets have been marginalized to the point of near extinction, in many cases, they have made a comeback, but maybe you have noticed that this is a gentrified and sanitized version of themselves, where handmade products and organic fruit and vegetables are sold for at least 10 times its standard price. Now, we'll not go on a rant against gentrified markets. I mean, don't get me wrong. I have myself spent quite a few weekends visiting and enjoying them, but I don't know if you agree with me with the fact that these types of markets have become... Well, yet another pastime of a lifestyle that only the aspirational middle and upper classes can afford. So, in a bold statement, I will say something that many sociologists have long foreseen. And that is that markets have been stripped off from their democratic essence, because they're no longer the place where, regardless of a person's income or social status, everyone equally exercises or used to exercise a right to be part of that social and cultural melting pot. But more importantly is the vacuum they left as a communal space that allowed us to weave relationships into the social tissue that, that builds our communities. And that is precisely what I learned and experienced while growing up in Mexico. Because Mexican markets are a bastion of that communal life. Today we're gonna make an epic plunge into one slice of the cultural history of Mexico, striking all sorts of cultural and historical aspects, proving, I guess, that to fully understand and appreciate our contemporary culinary expressions, we must take a few steps back and take a look at the bigger picture and see why the many traditions and rituals hidden in everyday life are the backbone of a country's identity in this case, of Mexico. When we look back in time and see how ancient civilizations worked, we often tend to measure their development in relation to our economic models, power relationships, and social structure. And I think that is precisely when we often miss the chance to fully understand them, because we have to use the proverbial lens of their own values, logic, and particular moment in time to appreciate them. In other words, when we only compare ancient civilizations against our own way of life, we deny ourselves the possibility to appreciate them for what they are in their own context. Now, with that said, let's grab our imaginary baskets and start making our way to the great market or Tianquistli, of ancient Tlatelolco, in today's Mexico City. And as we do that, let me take you back to life in the times of the Aztecs. By the mid-1300s of our era, the Mexica, or Aztec tribe, as is more commonly referred to, had set the foundations of what will become one of the most powerful and large empires of the Americas, that will eventually control most of the Mesoamerican territory. Now, this territory included what is today's central Mexico, all the way down to Central America. It was by using the power of their military structure combined with a ferocious expansionist policy that the Mexica systematically persuaded 
uh, mostly by boiling thousands of city-states into alliances to join the empire, and this was key to form the impressive network of trade routes that mobilized hundreds of products to the capital's grand markets. I know, I know you're impatient to go buy a luscious jaguar skin, crimson robes dyed with cochineal, and fresh fish from the Pacific coast. But before we do that, let me tell you that the economic system of the pre-Columbian world did not have a monetary system, uh, at least not as we know them now. Instead, they had an intricate tribute and tax system that required for every state to make specific payments in kind for concepts referring to land exploitation, military supplies, and rents on the use of imperial roads, amongst many other concepts. And you're probably thinking, what does that have to do with money anyway? Well, you see, contrary to popular belief, pre-Columbian tribes did not hoard treasures of gold and silver much to the disappointment of greedy conquistadors. Instead, they valued the possession of fertile lands, so that was one great asset to have. And also they have a particular soft spot for precious stones, exquisitely handmade products, and other items that together were regarded as commodities. And such commodities were often used to pay taxes and to make all sorts of transactions. Thanks to the detailed descriptions of historical documents, such as codex, we know that bartering was the main mechanism of trading products, often using a handy version of special commodities that had a similar function to that of money. Some of the most usual everyday commodities seen at the Great Tenkist list or markets were cocoa beans, you might have heard of that, gold dust packed in feather squills, salt, jade beads, fine feathers, obsidian, and precious seashells. All of these commodities were used to buy big and small quantities of products, and even luxury items such as sea fish, exotic meats, or jewelry. But also, exchanging things for something of an equivalent value was very common. Let's say, imagine you were a farmer, and you could exchange your surplus of corn for beans, or fabrics, or pottery. And as long as buyers and sellers were happy with the exchange, the gods supervising the markets had no problem with the transaction. Which actually reminds me, if you want to know more about trade and the specific use of cocoa in the Mayan and Mexica societies, you can explore more about this story in the Coco issue of Sabor, this is Mexican food magazine, which you can find on my website at pasdechipotle.com. So we find that throughout the world, not only in the Mexican Empire, many societies developed strong trade economies, and it was precisely those whose territory wasn't significantly prosperous, as it was the case of the capital of the Aztec Empire, Tenochtitlan, that started a quest for sourcing food, weapons, and other products. And that's how they built a very robust culture of trade, transport, and very efficient markets. We will return with the show after a short break. Mexico's grand fiestas are a unique way to remember and joyously celebrate our history, cultural diversity, and ancestral traditions. From the patriotic occasions like Independence Day and the anniversary of the Mexican Revolution to Christmas and Dia de la Candelaria and the world-famous Day of the Dead, these iconic celebrations bring together new and ancient traditions, from the spiritual to the joyous always welcoming locals and strangers in rewarding and soulful celebrations of life. The Mexican Fiestas issue of Sabor, this is Mexican food magazine, explores the cultural history of the nation's festive calendar through in-depth articles and many traditional recipes to prepare unique dishes like pozole, chiles en hogada, day of the dead bread, and many more. 
To know more about the wonderful articles and recipes to start the making of your own family traditions, please go to pasachipotle.com forward slash magazine. Take sabor with you on all your digital devices. Go to pasachipotle.com forward slash magazine and get ready to cook, learn and enjoy Mexican food like you never imagined. The city-state of Tlatelolco was located north in the ancient lake of Texcoco and was almost entirely dedicated to commerce, and it was home of the largest market of all of Mesoamerica. Texcoco was the lake where Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire, was located. There are detailed records in the Florentine Codex, one of the many surviving documents describing pre-Columbian life, that tells us loads about Tlatelolco's market, such as the volume and value of the transactions. And this market was so big and so important that it had its own governor and a body of three judges, guards and supervisors that commanded over the guard of couriers and traders. It had well-defined sections, and some of these sections included pottery, fabrics, animal skins, livestock such as turtles, raccoons, rabbits, exotic birds, turkeys, dogs, and even Xolusquintle, which is our native hairless dog. Other sections included fabrics, jewelry, and medicinal herbs and remedies, seeds, fresh produce, of course, and even slaves. They were purchased to work as servants or to be sacrificed and offered to the gods. A less known fact about pre-Columbian markets is that, just like in the case of medieval markets in Europe, they served as a forum and they were a perfect stage to carry on sentences, especially punishments that went from beating to lashings to even executions. And those were powerful lessons for the community to learn. I really didn't want to omit mentioning slave trade, because in spite of being a cruel and inhumane practice, it was all too common between pre-Columbian tribes, and just like in ancient Rome or Greece, slaves were regarded as property, and hence were an important part of the economy of the Anquistles, or markets. But no doubt, the section of the Tianquistli that captivates my imagination, and that of many of course, is that of the ready-made food. There, shoppers were able to enjoy the pleasures of treats such as tamales, tortillas, stews and atole, which is a drink that can be sweet or savory, prepared with corn masa to thicken it. There were also available many sorts of edible insects that were an important part of the Mexica diet. As I mentioned in previous episodes of the show, one of the many luxury foods that were sold in those markets, well, for those who could afford it, it was fresh, flavored snow from the Popocatépetl volcano, an unaffordable treat to most people, but not for the imperial tables, as it has been known to be an unmissable treat served daily at the Emperor Montezuma's table. If you're not impressed already with this amazing market, hear this. Not only the lack of working animals was already a challenge in pre-Columbian Mexico, with the absence of horses or donkeys, transporting and moving products had to be carried and transported by foot. That meant that, let's say, seafood that came from the Gulf of Mexico or the Pacific, vanilla from Veracruz, or monkeys that came from Chiapas, all of these had to be carried by the strong, fast and highly efficient members of the impressive organization called Pochtecas, who could mobilize products throughout the whole empire for thousands of miles using the imperial network of roads, meaning that jade or precious seashells from Yucatan that were sold in the Mexica capital had already traveled around 855 miles. Now, the very last part of the journey of all of these products that were imported from outside the Nochtitlan had to be made by water, because the capital of the empire was built on a system of interconnected lakes, man-made islands, and floating allotments, and a grid of canals that communicated all the quarters and were equally used for personal and commercial transport. For this last section of today's episode, 
I want to mention something that perhaps is less obvious but equally important as a social function of markets, because they had an important role as a model of collaboration and cultural exchange. I've been focusing on the Kenkisli of Tlatelolco, but there were thousands of grand indigenous markets spread throughout the pre-Columbian world, and they all played a number of roles in the indigenous society. Well, as I have mentioned, first and foremost, they were evidently economic powerhouses, but also they were very important spaces for socializing, and there were also other less obvious but equally important functions. One of them is that markets were a model of collaboration and cultural exchange because they were ethnically, linguistically and even religiously diverse as they attracted sellers and buyers from all the corners of the empire. Consequentially, also gastronomic cross-pollination was incredibly transcendent as the use of ingredients and cooking techniques were rapidly disseminated thanks to the markets. And something we don't quite consider very often is the fact that ancient Mexico was not at all a homogenized society. It was incredibly diverse, and quite often the views and ways of life between different tribes could cause frictions, but commerce, and more specifically markets, served as a sort of catalyst to soften and facilitate cultural interaction. And now I will tell you something about the last days of the great market of Tlatelolco. At the time that the Spanish conquistadors arrived in Mesoamerican shores in the 16th century, with a purpose to take absolute control of the territory, they had the opportunity to witness and experience firsthand many social practices, including, of course, markets. More specifically, the Tianquistli of Tlatelolco. Hernán Cortés, who was the named captain that led the conquest of the New World on behalf of the Spanish crown, wrote numerous letters addressed to the Emperor Charles V, and in one of them he vividly described the market of Tlatelolco, saying that at this magnificent market there was a normal average of 60,000 people buying and selling, and then in a very true Baroque fashion Cortés proceeded to describe in full detail what people were selling, stall by stall, and street by street. But you know what? None of this admiration was significant enough to prevent him from planning and carrying on an attack for a total of 75 days, when finally, on the 13th of August of that same year, the city was taken by the conquistadors and their allies, who ransacked, destroyed, and burned it, not before slaughtering more than 40,000 residents. But the story of the indigenous markets of Mexico didn't end here by any extent. So in the next episode, we will talk about the great resilience of this indigenous tradition that made its way into the colonial world, and that was the huge legacy that shaped the markets that still exist to this day. Thank you for listening. Paz de Chipotle was written and produced by me, Rocío Carvajal. To know more information about this project, please go to pazdechipotle.com. You can get in contact with me via email, send me a message to hello at pazdechipotle.com. Or if you prefer, you can contact me on Instagram or Twitter. If you haven't subscribed yet to my newsletter, you can find a link to do so in this episode's description, and you will get a nice welcome gift. In my latest newsletter, I made a book recommendation that I've personally reviewed, and it's called Cumin, Camels and Caravans, a Spice Odyssey by Gary Paul Nabhan. Very ad hoc with today's theme. You can read this review on my website in the Books for Cooks section. Remember that the show is also available on YouTube. Find the channel as Chipotle Podcast and check out the latest upload as it contains illustrations and photography related to today's episode. 
Remember to subscribe, rate and share the show. Well, that's it for this week, my friends. Until the next time.